From a vocational perspective, we don't think of jobs as being purposeful, but that is a mistake because all jobs, except, you know, evil jobs, I mean, mafia, hitman, prostitute wouldn't count, but all legitimate jobs are a calling. And we don't think that way. Growing up in, you know, Garden Variety Baptist Church, you know, the only real callings are preacher and maybe deacon, but certainly, you know, spec ops, that would be missionaries. And, you know, you're just a bad person if you're not thinking about going on the mission field. You know, well, but most people aren't ever gonna. Well, they're deficient. I mean, that's the implicit message. That's horribly wrong. God doesn't call many people to those ministries. In fact, God's very explicit that not many of you should be teachers. You have a, a tiny handful who get those callings, but they all have purpose. They all have purpose. That janitor, if that janitor does a really good job, people don't slip and fall and go on disability. If that janitor does a really good job, people don't get food poisoning and die. You know, that insurance salesman, you ask a widow how important the calling of a life insurance salesman was. That kind of thinking really transforms how we ought to look at every job under heaven, whatever it is. All of those things are callings and they all sum up to the, the fullness of the cultural mandate. Once we get some concept of, oh, we're not just a cog in the machine, if we have good education, like you said, a lot more people become entrepreneurs, now, there's only a limited number of people who really ought to be entrepreneurs. I understand that. Not everybody probably should be, but we want more people who creatively solve the problem of a disease. Uh, internal lighting, so children can study their lessons after dark. You can have a third shift at a factory. All of the different things that we are able to do because somebody was creative as our father is creative, those things all fall within entrepreneurship. That is the cutting edge of the cultural mandate. And those things, when you take them collectively and then you apply the same thinking to all vocations, really transform how we look at absolutely everything. And then, oh wait, we do have a manual for this and it's called the Bible. People think about vocation usually around the time they're trying to get out of high school and figure out what to do with their life. And then frequently they don't really think about it again. Vocation is just what you do. It's just how you pay the bills. You know, people tend to like to eat and live indoors and so they get a job and some of them think about it somewhat deliberately. My son, for instance, is a physician at the Mayo Clinic and he thought about it a whole lot all the way through uh, graduating from college at 19 and going to medical school at USF and then to Yale and Harvard and, and eventually Mayo. That's very deliberate vocation. but. Lots of people are like me. I was, a, I was a political science history major and I knew I wanted to go to law school, but you know, sometimes that doesn't work out for people. So they end up doing an arts and crafts degree and becoming a car salesman or something because hey, it was a job. But we need to think about vocation more deliberately, more biblically, because God thinks deliberately about everything. So. How would we think about vocation in a more biblical fashion? And how could we think about what we do in a way that is actually God honoring and more importantly, fulfilling of God's own plans? Now, God's gonna work out his plan, whatever you do. Uh, if, if you won't speak of him, the very rocks will cry out. We, we don't have to worry about God getting it done. But I want more purpose in my life than that. I would actually like to please my father. I would really like the opportunity to do something that is truly meaningful and purposeful, that actually makes a difference for somebody. And it might very well be that my purpose isn't anything that you know the world might call sexy. It may be that my purpose is as small as say, that of Hudson Taylor's grandfather. Hudson Taylor, the great evangelist who went to China and created the China Inland Mission and was the first man ever to bring about the evangelism of, of every single province of China. Every one of those provinces in the 19th century is now being as large in population as a large-ish European country. 
Hudson Taylor was a great man, and it's easy to think about how uh, the greatness of his calling and how he came to be a missionary and how he came to China and realized that uh, the foundations of the missionary society he was part of didn't really comport with what he wanted to do and what he thought God was calling him to do. And we'll talk about his his uh, uh, way of uh, God blessing him with enough money for the ministry and all the different aspects of his life. But sometimes we forget his mama. And even before her, his granddaddy. His granddaddy got saved in a barn on his wedding day two generations before Hudson Taylor went to China. We don't know a lot else about him except from the wonderful two-volume biography of Hudson Taylor written by his son, uh, Frederick. But we do know about his grandfather's tremendous faith and his influence on Hudson Taylor's mother and the long discipling and, and witnessing to Hudson of his mother and father who, who raised their children in, in a godly way. Their purpose was invested in those children and in making sure that they had a biblical foundation. And the result of that ultimately was this miraculous work of God that is comparable to the book of Acts in both extent and scope and, and productivity. Vocation doesn't have to be top of the ticket. You don't have to be the President of the United States. You don't have to be the King of England. You don't have to be the star of the movie. Honestly, vocation matters because everything God does matters. And if we are to love our neighbor as ourselves, just as we are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, then it occurs to me that the first thing we should think about is how are we in fact, whether we eat or drink or whatever we do, doing all to the glory of God? So let's say I find myself in a janitorial role. Is that a calling? Now, before you answer that, I want to remind you, especially those of you from Baptist world like me, I grew up in a little Baptist church in, in Arkadelphia, Arkansas, and before that in an even smaller uh, Baptist church in, in Ozark, Arkansas. And yes, the mascot was the Ozark Hillbillies. And so, so you can imagine this is not probably something that the people on Park Avenue would consider especially sophisticated. Just normal folks in a normal place in a normal state. And we weren't anybody special and we weren't rich. We weren't, we weren't notable. What were we taught? I don't think anybody taught us this idea of vocation explicitly, but I think all of us just had the idea as say a 13 year old boy or a 17 year old high school student that really God has callings and then God permits jobs. So let's think about that a second. God has callings. Obviously, at least from the perspective of a teenage boy in a normal Baptist church in a normal little town, obviously being a pastor is having a calling. You're called to the pastorate. Maybe you're even called to be a deacon. But if you really, really want to be the special forces of God's army, you, you're a missionary. Now that's a calling. That, that's real. Oh, but my dad sells insurance. Well, you know, I guess that's okay because he tithes. Is that how God looks at any of this? No. So we start in the garden. What does God tell Adam in the garden? Well, first of all, God gave Adam a job. You might get the idea that Adam's just loafing around on a, on a, a bar stool or a barca lounger and enjoying the beauty of the garden. That, that's not what God told Adam to do. Adam's first job is, is to look at all of the animals. God brings the animals in front of Adam and, and Adam names them. Maybe we think about that the way we did when we were in fifth grade Sunday school and, oh, Adam got to name the zebra. That's not what's happening. Adam's first job was to scientifically classify the entire zoological world. Adam was a scientist. Adam was also there to tend the garden. Yes, God planted a garden in Eden, but who was there to tend it? Now, without the curse, that's a lot easier job. God knows, that's, that's different. 
than what I would have to do in the garden, and I have kind of a black thumb, so guaranteed my garden would die. But but Adam apparently was pretty good at it, and, and certainly God gave him every opportunity to be. And so he's a gardener, he is a scientist, then he's a husband. He's told he needs to be a father, too, because in the garden he's given the creation mandate, what, what many of our friends call the cultural mandate. You may have heard it that way. Uh, sometimes we call it the creation mandate just because outside of certain circles no one has heard cultural mandate and they don't immediately identify with that. But the idea is the same, to be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, and, and the rest of the passage. What is Adam being called to do? Well, well, to put it in modern terms, Adam's being told, I, God, have planted this garden here. Now you, my son, go make the world like this. The garden is a template. Adam is to go out and, and once he has uh, gotten his bearings, to make the world Edenic. Now, how do we know that's true? Well, first of all, because that's the logical implication of the creation mandate. But, but wait, there's more. Because we see the imagery of Eden throughout Scripture. We see it in the breastplate of the high priest. We see it in the east gate of the temple. We see it ultimately in the new Jerusalem descending from the sky at the end of Revelation with the rivers from Eden and with the gemstones and, and the garden has become a city. What is, what is the difference between the garden in Eden and the new Jerusalem to come? Population. They have been fruitful. They have multiplied. And God has multiplied them through the, through the exercise of the Great Commission and through our witnessing and through our evangelism that the lost sheep may come home. That new Jerusalem is the outworking, yes, of the Great Commission, absolutely. But it's also the outworking of that creation mandate all the way in the beginning. God finishing his creation, you may have thought it was finished in six days, it's still going on now. Finishing his creation, got it all built up. You know, think of it as building a house. The builder comes in, lays the foundation, puts up the studs, puts up a roof, does all, puts in the plumbing, all the things that, that need to be done for the decorator to come in and finish it out and make it livable. We're the decorators in a sense. God has built his creation and then we, his children, get to finish it out and make it that perfect place to come. We don't get to do it in our own strength, of course, because again, it's all of grace and it's all his power, but we do get to participate and it's a great blessing. So if you take that theological foundation of vocation, you realize a couple of things. First, you realize that this idea of a cultural mandate or a creation mandate is not restricted to the, to the world before the fall. No, not at all. Indeed, that same commandment is given to Noah after the flood. So not only after the fall, but after God has destroyed an entire world and brought one family forward in the ark to make everything new. So we know that that ongoing creation that God is working out that we delight and glory in getting to participate in with our Father is indeed an operative command that applies to us today. And moreover, we see it in various places in the Bible. And since I'm in Genesis, I'll just, I'll just pull one out uh, off the top of my head. How about the Tower of Babel? Everybody wants to focus in on the tower, like God cares about towers. Well, there's a sense in which I'm sure he did, but that's not the point of that story at all. The point of that story is that the people grouped up in one place and would not spread out and fill the earth, multiply, and, and fulfill God's command. And God confuses not just their languages, but, but I am told by smart people who know these things that, that the word used 
for languages, or what we translate as languages, actually means ideas. So, so they were joined in one set of ideas as well as languages, and God scatters them so that they will actually go out and, and a division of labor is forced upon them, and they start settling the world. And shortly after that, we get the table of nations, and we get the foundation of the entire modern world. God is very serious about finishing his original purpose. Now, how does that apply to the janitor? Well, whatever you do, do it to the glory of God, remember? Well, what does a janitor do? Well, a janitor is a very important person. A janitor, if he doesn't do his job well, is likely to cause slip and falls. People may, may lose days at work. They may, they may lose their health. Maybe they lose the use of a back or a foot or something. The janitor matters. More than that, what if the janitor, maybe it's a Taco Bell. Maybe he doesn't clean up in the kitchen. Maybe people die of food poisoning. You say, well... That's not how I think about janitorial work. Well, maybe you should. The janitor matters. That's a calling. It may not be a glorious calling, but neither is washing feet. Vocation is about doing whatever God puts you in contact with well and with purpose for the greater outworking of all of his kingdom and all of his glory. You might say, well, you know, the janitor can serve God by witnessing to people. Well, maybe he can. That's also true. I would suggest to you that the Great Commission is really the flip side of the same coin. That indeed, when we look at what God has done in the Old and New Covenants, what we see is this two-sided coin again and again and again. This outworking of the physical creation and this recreation of the fallen men. These are not separate things. These are not things at cross purposes. These are things that work together. So, yes, absolutely. The janitor can witness. The janitor might be able to leave a tract at a key moment or say a word fitly spoken to, to an assistant manager. By the way, what is the assistant manager there to do? The assistant manager is there making sure that people are fed. Let's take it from Taco Bell and put it at McDonald's. You may not know this, but McDonald's every single day feeds one out of every 100 people on planet Earth. That's an extraordinary thing. You say, well, it's junk food and we don't like it. Really? I bet you if you were starving in Ethiopia, you might be really happy to get a McDouble. That's 350 calories of good food, and it isn't rancid, and it won't kill you. That's a calling. McDonald's is solving a massive problem. No, I don't own any stock, but I'm impressed because those guys, every day of the week, are feeding the hungry. And you can say, well, uh, maybe not well. Well, maybe somebody doesn't want your fancy tofu. Maybe there are different tastes. Maybe the issue isn't that everybody conforms to your dietary preferences. Maybe the issue is that everybody gets to have a diet at all. That's an extraordinary thing. And modern technology has brought that about. You say, oh, well, certainly somebody in the railroad business wouldn't have a calling. Really? Because the truth is, we abolished famine in the Western world with the advent primarily of two technologies, railroads and canning because a railroad could actually move canned food to any place that was experiencing a famine and suddenly people weren't dying. Oh well, I can see how a doctor may have a calling, but those greedy pharmaceutical companies, they certainly don't. Really? When I was a kid, my grandfather died of stomach cancer. He wouldn't have died of that if he'd gotten it today. Why? because of medical technologies invented by those greedy pharmaceutical companies and medical device companies. You say, well, they're just in it for the money. Why should I care? What's it to me? Why am I wanting to break the 10th commandment and covet what they have and, and worry about their motives while they do a good thing? Those who are not against us are with us for this purpose, at least, because truly, 
If grandma gets 10 more years of life, that's not just a calling, that's a miracle. Here's what I want to point out, and again, some of our churches do not understand this, and in fact, some of them even go so far as to repudiate it. The truth is, you are not just an adjunct to your church. The kingdom is not just what's within the four walls of your church. God is the creator of all things, and Jesus told us as he introduced the Great Commission, all power in heaven and on earth has been given unto me. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. But notice the preface. Easy to remember the marching order. Remember the preface. All power in heaven and on earth has been given unto me. Likewise, Christ's Father created all things, and we are taught uh, very plainly by the Apostle John that not one thing that was created was created but through Christ and by Christ. So the, the Trinitarian aspect of this is, is made very explicit in the Scripture. So if we are to serve Him who has all power, if we are to love our God with our whole heart, if we are to love our neighbor as ourself, then first of all, we must honor Him in our work, and second, we must absolutely solve the problems of those around us. Now, let's examine that just a bit. I've talked about vocation, but I want you to think about it in a system of free markets because that is the system in which most of the people watching this actually live. In a system of freedom, it is true that many people will work for their own selfish purposes. I'm not troubled by that at all. In fact, I kind of marvel at it. Because God's laws plainly respect private property, plainly require you not only not to steal someone else's private property, but actually not to even think about it. That, of course, being the 10th commandment. God is absolutely committed to this system, which makes us think twice about those who are not. Moreover, God knows that man is fallen. So why would he give such a law to man if indeed the law was inevitably corrupt? That just doesn't sound a lot like God. So what I marvel at about the system of free economics, of free markets, what we call capitalism, what I marvel at is that it does something like only God can do. It actually harnesses our selfishness to achieve a good result. Now, somebody might very well decide that they want to make Nike tennis shoes and that the reason they want to do that is so that they can have a great big mansion and a giant private jet and a 300-foot mega yacht. And if they want to do that, hey, that's between them and God. I have no issue with that. Mega yachts are cool. Maybe we can have a church service on a mega yacht. That'd be great. I'm sure uh, Tom Askell will come and preach. But Let's say it's completely selfish. Let's say it's completely self-aggrandizing. Let's say there is no good in it. The person doing this is actually a heel, maybe just a terrible person. Does it matter? Well, it matters to that person. He's going to have to answer to that for God. But what did he do to make the money? What is it exactly that he did to earn the mega yacht? I'll tell you, what did I say at the outset? He made tennis shoes. Do you need tennis shoes? Well, as a matter of fact, a lot of people do. How many people in the history of mankind have done without proper footwear? Does it matter? Yes, it absolutely does. Moreover, were they good tennis shoes? Were they high quality? Were they actually something that served the interests of regular people? Well, apparently so, because the guy was able to afford a mega yacht. Lots of people bought it, presumably at a good price, high quality at a good price. You say, well, you know, I just think that that's all selfish and greedy. Yeah, but are you going to deprive the whole world of good footwear because you don't like the guy who sells it? That's crazy. Freedom, free markets, what we call capitalism, 
actually encourages people, regardless of their motivation, to first figure out problems that regular people have, second, come up with a solution for that problem, third, actually put their own time and treasure into executing that solution. And then the beauty of the free market system is that at the end of all of that, the consumer still gets to choose whether that solution is the right one for them and their family. No one gets to force it on you. How is that not the societal level application of do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Love your neighbor as yourself. It's an extraordinary thing. And the entire system creates a, an environment in which everyone is incentivized to think about other people's problems and try to solve them all day, every day, forever. That's an extraordinary thing. And once you kind of grasp that idea, then vocation falls in very easily because it makes sense that, oh wait, I'm actually doing something that matters for the world when I actually make good tennis shoes or when I sell good tennis shoes or when I sell insurance to the guy who sells the tennis shoes or when I, when I coach soccer for the kids of the guy who sold the tennis shoes. All of these things matter. They add up and they make a better world together. The banker is gifted in a certain way. The lawyer is gifted in a certain way. The air conditioner repairman is gifted in a certain way. They all matter. Their callings are important. It is important for our churches to actually pay attention to those callings. It is a grave mistake when we lose that idea and when we actually teach things that lead people to believe that what they do does not matter. The truth is, what they do does matter, and not just as an ATM for the offering plate. What they do matters because it intrinsically matters. God has made them to do these things, and what they do serves society. It loves neighbors, and it pushes back the curse. It is fundamentally a theological point. There is no escaping the reality that all of this does spring from the creation mandate or the cultural mandate. All of this is an outworking of God's point that it is the glory of God to conceal a matter and the glory of kings to search it out. These aren't necessarily actual political kings. I think anybody who has uh, come in contact with uh, a Warren Buffett or a Bill Gates or a Peter Thiel or, or a Steve Jobs knows that uh, their, their not political kingdoms are bigger and greater in scope than many of the political kingdoms of this world. These are all people who started small and did great things because they sought to solve a problem. And there are no problems other than the problem of lostness that aren't a function of the physical, the physical nature of the curse. That scarcity, that want that comes from the creation being subjected to death and decay. If we can push back against that decay, lives are improved. You can say, well, Bill Gates' life has certainly been improved. Yes, but how many billions of people's lives have been improved by Bill Gates? Now, I'm an Apple person, so I'd rather use Steve Jobs as an example. But the point is exactly the same. How much better off am I if I can have a pocket computer that, by the way, has more computing power than existed in the entire world when we walked on the moon? How much better off is the world if countless millions of small children have such a device to learn things on, to look up data on the fly, to do calculations, to, to do incredible things that, that scientists in universities couldn't have done when I was a kid? We have this theological foundation. We have this God-given manual on how to carry out our lives and how they fit together. And in all of this, we have the joy of pleasing our Father and the purpose and meaning 
of co-workers with Christ, whether our primary calling is spiritual or our primary calling is material makes no difference because they go together. You're constantly doing material things and you should constantly be studying the word and telling your neighbor about it. They are all of a piece and they are all to be honored together. We sometimes talk about a distinction between the secular and sacred. I'm here to tell you there's no such thing. It all belongs to our Father, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and He alone gets the glory from what we do. But what we do is glorious. It matters, and it doesn't matter at all if you are the nurse's aide or the inventor of nursing. It does not matter at all if you are a, a fisherman out uh, on the beach, or if you are the owner of the biggest food company in the world, it does not matter what station God has given you. It matters that whatever we eat or drink or whatever we do, we do all to the glory of God. So I encourage you to take joy in your vocation, to determine what your vocation is or ought to be, Perhaps you're in a job that isn't really your true calling. Give that a thought. Give it some prayer. Spend time in the Word. Make sure that you're really where God has you to be. And then run. Run hard. Finish the race well. Be the best of whatever you are that you can be to His glory. Be like Bezalel. Be like Hiram, the men that God entrusted with the work of the physical formation of the tabernacle and the temple and all of the implements of the two. We are still thousands of years later giving glory to those workmen because they were indeed excellent and what they did gave God glory. What you do gives God glory more than you think. And you should actually become self, uh, become conscious of that, become aware of that, and begin to start working out how can I do that better? <laughs>